Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of uh, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verses 27 through 42. It is on page 774 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. (coughs) Starting in verse 27. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned (coughs) by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might represent, or that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thutius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men you will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you probably already know, I really enjoy movies. Movies are a great uh, event for me, really, especially when they come to the theaters. One movie franchise that I I have really been enjoying over the last... uh, roughly two plus decades, especially over the last few years, are the uh, Tom Cruise-led movies Mission Impossible. Or maybe if you don't necessarily watch the Mission Impossible movies, maybe you remember the uh, late 60s, early 70s TV show of the same name, which most of the time starred Peter Graves. Well, the TV show and the movies often have kind of the same uh, plot points. They they end up following a, a, a similar design. First, the episode begins with the IMF agent uh, getting his assignment through some kind of recording, and and the uh, typical ending is this tape will self-destruct in five five seconds. Hopefully you remember that. And then the agent would get some kind of dossier, and that would inform them and give them more information about the person or the the thing that they were supposed to track down, and then the team would, would figure out a plan and then execute that plan, usually with some outlandish ways to, to execute the plan. And then, of course, even though the, the, the title said Mission Impossible, they would always accomplish the mission in the end, and they would save the day, and everyone would be happy, right? That was, those are the Mission Impossible possible stories. Well, our text from the book of Acts this morning kind of reminds me a little bit about uh, the Mission Impossible stories. The disciples are given a mission by Jesus to go and spread the news of the resurrection. They aren't quite told that the the, the tape would self-destruct, 
but they were given this mission nonetheless. They find themselves in an extremely difficult circumstance, possibly almost in the end dead, but at the end, their goal is accomplished. We find the apostles in quite the bind. Now, before I continue, I want to make sure we're on the same page with regard to to terms and definitions. When we were going through the, the Gospels of Mark and Luke, which I've been going through quite a bit since I've been here, usually we regarded the 12 as the disciples. Well, now we're on the other side of Jesus' resurrection. And in the beginning parts of the book of Acts, Jesus has ascended back to the right hand of God. And the disciples, we know as the disciples, are given a new name. This name is the title apostles. Now the term apostles comes from a Greek term meaning one who is sent or a sent one. And this makes perfect sense because before Jesus went back to the hand of the Father, Jesus sent his disciples into the world to proclaim the gospel message of his life, his death, and his resurrection. So now, after that event, we refer to the 11 remaining chief disciples, so like Peter and John and James, obviously not including Judas, but when we, and then we include Matthias and Paul, we refer to these people as the apostles, the sent ones. And as we mentioned last week, the apostles were stunned when they found Jesus' empty tomb. They didn't quite know what to do. But after encountering the risen Lord, and once the Holy Spirit descended upon them, they were on fire to spread the good news. And a little bit before our text this morning, in chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, Luke, who is the author of both the Gospel of Luke and also the Acts of the Apostles, records that the disciples were really successful in their mission that Jesus gave them. They were performing miraculous signs and wonders in the name of Jesus, and many men and women were being included into the fellowship. But all of this hubbub that was going on in the courts of Jerusalem did not go unnoticed by the Jewish leadership. The high priest noticed this and his associates, and so they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. Again, kind of this Mission Impossible kind of theme. They they were in a rough spot. But an angel of God appeared, opened the prison doors, and encouraged them to continue preaching in Jesus' name. Now, the high priest and the temple guard were quite stunned when they did not find the apostles in their jail cell. But then they were alerted to how the apostles were in the temple courts preaching once again. And this is where we begin our text for this week. Starting in verse 27, all the apostles are brought before the Jewish high council, or what we call the Sanhedrin, to be questioned by the high priest. They were accused of disobeying the orders to stop teaching in Jesus' name. And they were also accused of making the Jewish high leadership feel guilty of Jesus' blood. They didn't like the apostles. They didn't like their message. And they wanted to try and squash the momentum that they seemed to be gaining before they truly got out of hand. And so now with the accusations put forth in verse 29, Peter and the apostles make their defense. Peter probably speaks up on behalf of the group. The words we read are probably his, probably with the other disciples agreeing on what he says. Peter announces first that they must obey God rather than men, and he continues to preach the gospel message to the Sanhedrin. He ends his speech in verse 32 with a claim that they are witnesses to these things, and the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Now the apostles' message does not land kindly on the ears of the Sanhedrin. They become enraged, so enraged that they actually want to put all the apostles to death. But a man named Gamaliel speaks up. 
It is said that he is one of the greatest teachers of his time, and fortunately for the disciples and for the Christian movement, has a very cool, calm head on his shoulders. The apostles' miracles that they performed and the escape from prison must have made him pause for at least a second and consider that maybe God was truly behind this new movement. Whether he truly believed it or not, we, don't, we really don't know, but it made him pause for just a second. And this is why Gamaliel proposes to let this new movement play out. See where it goes. He cites two cases where people proclaim to be God's Messiah, but ultimately they were killed and their followers scattered. Because he says if, if this person, this Jesus person, proclaims to be the Messiah and his disciples claim that he is, but it's really of human thought, of human origin, it will more than likely fizzle out. But if God is truly behind this Jesus movement, Gamaliel feared that if they opposed it, they would be opposing God himself, which would not end very well. Gamaliel's advice persuades the Sanhedrin to drop the charges of death, but they still give the apostles a flogging and charge them again to be silent. Now, maybe I just don't quite understand the apostles, but amazingly, in verse 41 and 42, Luke records that the apostles actually rejoice over their beating because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Now, this may not quite compute in our minds that disgrace, public disgrace, is a measure of worth. But as we go through the book of Acts, we, we begin to see this theme that the apostles considered an, an honor to suffer for Christ. And it brought them joy. And the apostles were so joy-filled after they were beaten that they disregarded the Sanhedrin's command and they continued to preach the name of Jesus to anyone who would listen. I want to emphasize three things from our text this morning. First, the boldness of the apostles is something I really, truly admire. Even when they were threatened with beatings, with jail, even with death, they were driven to be Jesus' witnesses to the world. They were willing to disobey the Jewish authorities in order to please God. But I think we must exercise caution with taking this idea. Because there have been many Christians throughout the centuries who have abused these verses by claiming that their selfish desires were God's will and they disobeyed authorities in order to satisfy those selfish desires. Other places in the Bible do tell us to be obedient to governing authorities. Peter himself in his first letter says to us, submit yourselves, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted by men, whether to the king or to the governors. We need to be extremely careful when we seek to disobey authority to uphold our faith. The early church would not be silenced on account of their faith, but more often than not, they worked within the governmental system. There have been many debates over the centuries on how Christians should approach civil disobedience. The classic modern example is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who himself participated in an assassination attempt against Hitler. Many Christians consider Bonhoeffer a hero some aren't sure he did it the right way. But I think we can agree that in the face of blatant injustice and oppression, 
the church should not stand silent. We must stand up for the ways of our Lord, but we must do so with prayer and with caution. The second thing I want to talk about is Gamaliel. For almost 2,000 years, I think the church has been very grateful to Gamaliel for his advice to the Sanhedrin. God used it to, to grow the church. Gamaliel was concerned that he may be fighting against God, and if God wills something, it surely will be done. I think this is encouraging for us who are current witnesses to Christ's work and resurrection. As Jesus said to Peter, the gates of hell will not overcome Christ's church. If we are obedient and if we follow Jesus' lead, we are told our mission is blessed by God and it will not fail. It may not be as we always imagined it or as we always want it to be, but before Jesus ascended, he promised his disciples, including us, that he will be with us to the end. The third thing I want to mention is the apostles' passion. Despite being beaten, probably to almost a pulp, they rejoiced because they were beaten for their faith. And the beating that they received did not discourage their mission to be witnesses. This kind of passion has been seen through Christians of the centuries, especially in the early church. Woof! The early church, they were, they were almost lining up to be martyrs at times. Ignatius of Antioch in Syria was martyred around 107 AD. And he prayed before he died, I thank you, Lord and Master, that you have deemed to honor me by, by making complete my love for you and that you have bound me with chains of iron to your Apostle Paul. This kind of attitude isn't one we usually see today. Usually when we are publicly ridiculed, especially for our faith, we tend to feel ashamed, maybe even we feel angry, probably because we have in our mind that we want to be honored in the public's eye. We don't want to be shamed. But throughout the last 200 centuries, there have not been too many Christians who have been highly looked upon in the public eye. But I think we should take the apostles' mindset that they weren't so concerned about their public reputation. Instead, they were more concerned about fulfilling their mission being witnesses and pleasing God. So my hope and prayer this morning for us in this room is that we take a little bit of the passion that the, the, the apostles had, that little, the fire that they had in their bellies for Jesus. May we too have that desire and that fire to tell the world what we know about God. And may we not be discouraged by the temporary defeats we receive, whether we are truly physically beaten or even if it's an emotional beat when we are rejected and people don't respond to us. Because we know that Christ is risen. And we know that we are called to be witnesses to his resurrection. And we have the promise of Jesus that he will be with us all the way. Amen.